So the B cell engages an antigen um, on the surface of a pathogen in the lymph node. And when it engages, you take the B cell receptor, the B cell co-receptor, um, what happens? Mitosis, right? We only have one of these B cells with its unique uh, antigen binding site. We need to expand this clone. So we had clonal selection, one B cell out of a million binds, and now we have clonal expansion, lots and lots of mitosis of that one clone. So in the lymph node, the lymph node swells with B cells that are a clone of this one B cell. So we call this clonal expansion. We have a, now a population of B cells identical to the original one, and we call these B lymphoblasts. Now, these can undergo uh, some different fates. Some of them will start secreting IgM. And IgM is a good first line of defense for uh, antibodies, for secreting antibodies. Um, but IgM is not the best antibody to make. So some of these B lymphoblasts will uh, continue engaging with T cells. And as we saw in the last video, there's a protein-protein interactions between proteins on the surface of the B cell and proteins on the surface of the helper T cell. And that T cell will also secrete cytokines that will turn on enzymes like AID and UNG, which will allow this um, B cell to undergo somatic hypermutation and isotype switching. So these cells undergo mitosis every six hours, and they are going to make a population of cells called centroblasts. And this is the reason why your lymph nodes swell when you have an infection and they're tender. Why are they swollen and tender? They are filled with millions of B cells, right? Um, some of them are secreting IgM. Some of them are undergoing somatic hypermutation, and we're going to select which ones are good. So if you recall the process of somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation, those involve the enzymes AID and UNG. And what are those enzymes doing? They are going to the variable region, of the heavy and light chain genes, and they are randomly choosing, choosing cytosines, and AID is uh, deaminating in the cytosines, converting it to uracil. UNG, uracil DNA glycosylase, removes the uracil and replaces the DNA repair enzymes to replace the uracil with a random nucleotide, which could change the codon, which could change the amino acid present in the variable region, which then could change the affinity of the antibody for the antigen. So you've got these cells, these centroblasts, and each one of them is turning on AID and UNG. Each one of them is probably mutating a different cytosine. So it's mutating a different nucleotide and a different codon and therefore a different amino acid. So this is occurring in the centroblasts. They've um, They've uh, reproduced, there's lots of mitosis, but now each one of them is slightly different from another because each one of them have mutated probably a different uh, cytosine in the variable region of the light and heavy chain. So if we go back and think about the heavy chain protein and the light chain protein, right, coded for by the heavy chain gene and the light chain gene that have been recombined, um, when we covered somatic hypermutation, we talked about random cytosines mutating and uh, possibly changing the codon and therefore amino acids in the variable region of the protein. So that's occurring in this one B cell, and it's going to present, uh, or it's going to load, uh, no, it's not going to load, it's going to make its heavy chain and light chain protein, which go to the surface, and it's slightly different than the original one. Another B cell might mutate different cytosines, different nucleotides, different amino acids, and so it's going to make a heavy and light chain which is different than the one above, different from the original. And this goes on and on. So you have these uh, cells that we saw in the last um, slide, and they're centrocytes. They've all undergone somatic hypermutation in the variable region of the light and the heavy chain genes. Do all of these get to survive? Absolutely not, because now we're going to have to test to see which ones have high affinity for the pathogen. So as they've been dividing, undergoing mitosis, and they've been mutating, they haven't been uh, expressing their Ig molecules. Now they're done mutating. They all express their Ig molecules on their surface. And now they're going to have a little competition. Who binds the strongest? 
the strongest will survive. So we're going to have a little bit of evolution here. It's survival of the fittest. So there is a limited amount of pathogens in the lymph nodes. There are many, many uh, centrocytes with mutated uh, Ig regions. And so what's going to happen is a competition. Um, these uh, mutated IgEs, um, if they have a high affinity for the pathogen, will bind to it and survive. Ones that have low affinity, they're not going to survive. So there's a little bit of competition going on here. Um, the ones with low affinity will not bind strongly to the pathogen, and what happens is they are eliminated via apoptosis. So when you feel those swollen lymph nodes, uh, some of those are B cells that have undergone somatic hypermutation, but changing certain amino acids either didn't change the affinity of the antigen for the antigen binding site, or maybe even lowered the affinity, made it even worse. You know what those B cells do? They die, go away by apoptosis. Because what you're trying to do here is trying to improve affinity of the Ig molecule for the antigen. That one at the bottom, it must have mutated some nucleotide into some amino acid that makes that antigen binding site fit better into the antigen. So it has high affinity, and so it gets to survive. It binds strongly to the pathogen, it gets a survival signal, and it has basically undergone affinity maturation. So not all cells that undergo somatic hypermutation survive. In fact, most cells that undergo somatic hypermutation die after that because mutating the variable region either didn't change the affinity or possibly lowered the affinity. Only the ones that increase the affinity survive the uh, competition for the pathogen. So now the cells have undergone somatic hypermutation and few of them have undergone affinity maturation. The surviving ones will undergo more mitosis, and they have a nice high affinity antibody. So that's great. We have, uh, we've undergone affinity maturation. At the same time, the process of isotype switching is going on. So let's recall isotype switching, what that involves. So here's the heavy chain gene. I drew it at the top. There's the VDJ regions that's recombined at interjunctional diversity. Those are all the different constant regions, constant mu, constant delta, constant alpha, constant gamma, there, which are a bunch, and constant epsilon. So in a uh, naive B cell, the mRNA is read through the variable region and then the constant mu and constant delta regions in order to make either the, the um, heavy chain uh, mu version, which will make IgM, or the delta version, which will make IgD. So that's in a developing B cell, it's in a naive B cell, but once a B cell has undergone um, clonal expansion and has gotten a signal from the helper T cell, the cell can now also, also undergo isotype switching. So let's see how that occurs. So. Don't forget, we've got helper T cells um, directing this process. So the proteins on the surface of the helper T cell are engaging the proteins on the surface of the B cell. And we talked about um, in a video quite a while ago when we talked about chapter four, the process of isotype switching, which involved these DNA regions located between the constant regions of DNA called switch sequences. And we mentioned the enzymes AID and UNG would land on the switch sequences and trigger recombination of the DNA to, a, uh, to align a new constant region with the VDJ region. So now we're going to see how it works. So if you need to refresh, go back to that video from chapter four on isotype switching. So what's going to happen here is it's the uh, helper T cell is going to direct isotype switching via cytokines. So somehow the helper T cell knows uh, something about the infection. It knows something about its characteristics and says, you know what? We really could use IgG to fight in this infection. The IgG, it's a monomer. Um, it can get into lots of different diffuse extravascular sites. Uh, it can attack via neutralization or opsonization or activate complement. So the T cell knows, you know what, we IgG would be great to fight this infection, this pathogen. So um, helper T cells secrete specific cytokines to direct switching to specific constant regions. So for example, 
Um, and your book goes into detail into some of these cytokines that are known to trigger specific isotypes to be switched. For example, IL-4. It's a cytokine released by a helper T cell, goes to a activated B cell, and tells that helps direct AID to certain switch regions. So these two switch regions, which I'm pointing to, if AID attack those and UNG attack those and the repair enzymes came in, what would occur is that this whole region of DNA would be removed, right? So remember, isotype switching involves recombination, physically cutting and pasting the DNA together again. So um, the, it's the cytokine signal from the T cell helps direct AID to certain switch sequences. And now, what are you left with? You're left with the VDJ gene segments, which go to the variable region, now hooked up to the constant gamma DNA. And when this is transcribed and translated, you're going to make a heavy chain protein that has the FC gamma region. And if you put that protein on the surface of a B cell, it's IgG. All right, so what did that? What directed this whole process? It's the cytokines coming from the helper T cells. So helper T cells can release many different cytokines. And actually, I'm not really interested in you knowing which ones specifically direct which isotypes to be switched to. Just sort of be familiar with, you know, the different cytokines such as IL-4, 5, interferon gamma, TGF beta. Some of these might look familiar to you. Uh, we might have talked about them in other processes in the past, and that's true. Sometimes cytokines are used for multiple processes. So when a helper T cell recognizes, oh, we need to make IgA, or oh, really, IgE would really help us fight this infection, the helper T cell releases specific cytokines, which will hit the uh, B cell, which will direct AID to certain constant regions. So if we want to recombine to make IgE, AID would land on the switch sequences so that constant epsilon would be hooked up to the VDJ region. Okay, so that's uh, isotype switching. We've done isotype switching, we've done affinity maturation, and now we finally have these B cells, which are have re make really high affinity antibody, which have made a very specific antibody. And now these B cells, which we have many of, more proliferation, more mitosis, some of them differentiate into plasma cells. So plasma cells are really the effector B cells. They are the cells that are going to help us combat the infection because they secrete immunoglobulin. It is isotype switch immunoglobulin. It is high affinity immunoglobulin. They typically don't have immunoglobulin on their surface anymore. They just go into secretion mode. They, their cytoplasm actually is filled with ER and Golgi. And so they have tons of ER and tons of Golgi because if you recall, for uh, a cell to secrete um, proteins and release them, it needs those proteins go through the, um, the membrane system of the cell, the ER and the Golgi. So the plasma cells secrete uh, immunoglobulin. These cells live for weeks, if not months, maybe possibly even years. It's not, there's some debate in the scientific community as to how long these cells live for. They definitely live for weeks. After an infection, you're churning out antibodies for quite a while to make sure that you remove the pathogen and it remove it all from the body. But antibody titers then go down eventually. They don't go down to zero though. So there seem to be plasma cells that possibly live for a very long time, just secreting low levels of antibody just to keep you sort of uh, protected from any re-exposure. Um, so they definitely live for weeks, maybe months, possibly years, um, because you definitely do produce low levels of antibody uh, for the rest of your life against the pathogen. Some of the B cells turn into memory B cells. And so these have Ig on their surface, right? and they live definitely for the your entire life. Um, so they're very long-lived cells. They have high affinity an antibodies on their surface, I'm sorry, immunoglobulins, and they've already undergone isotype switching. We'll talk in a later video how one reactivates memory B cells um, and some important aspects of reactivating them.